Welcome everyone to the webinar, one year on the situation for at-risk Afghans in Afghanistan and, and abroad. My name is Camille Lokos and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute, MPI and MPI Europe. And I'll start with a quick housekeeping note. If you have any technical problem, please email events at migrationpolicy.org. We will have a Q&A at the end of each panel. Um, there will not be a voice Q&A, so please type any question into the Q&A box or email at event at migrationpolicy.org. So today we'll be discussing the situation of Afghans nearly one year after the Taliban takeover. And we wanted to have this conversation as a two-part panel. First, we'll be discussing the situation in Afghanistan and in the neighborhood where most Afghans live. Um, the situation in the past year has been, has been grim, um, from increased food insecurity to the disintegration of the private sector, the breakdown of many public services that were funded um, by international money. Girls have not been able to attend school despite the initial promise of the Taliban authorities. And there, there have been other issues, a recent health care, the dramatic effect of climate change on community withdrawal floodings, um, but nonetheless, the very worst scenario have not materialized. Um, ed actor have been able to return. Uh, access to some provinces has, has improved and people have been fleeing the country, but not to the level that, that was initially feared. And so far, the international donor response has been mixed. Um, the UN, the United Nations has been driving this fundraising efforts in the response in Afghanistan. Um, they've been asking for $4.4 billion um, dollar to support their operation in the country. And donors have initially been responsive to, to, this, um, to this ask. Um, the EU committed to 1 billion euro last October. And so far, 2.4 billion out of this 4.4 billion have, have been pledged. Um, but th this, is, this is a difficult situation for donors. Are they facing difficult choices? On the one hand, um, there is this priority to help the Afghan population while not legitimizing the, the regime, engage with them and advocate for the rights of minority, women and other vulnerable group, while making clear that you know, invitation to an international conference does not mean formal recognition of, of the new authorities in Kabul. And while the focus has been on humanitarian aid in the past year, there is this awareness among all actors that this is not enough. And there is this ongoing conversation on how to maintain basic services and avoid the failure of the state, while also creating firewalls to avoid uh, funding directly the regime. So we'll address all of this question um, first, and then I'll turn to my colleague Susan Fratsky to talk about the other side of the story, um, you know, the other pillar of international efforts in Afghanistan at the moment, which are evacuation efforts and access to safe pathways, because these efforts have continued in the past year, and we wanted to take stock of, you know, the status of this evacuation, what pathways are still available, what new pathways have been created, and, you know, whether this unprecedented situation has allowed for more creativity, more coordination between countries, with some very difficult question um, on how to select uh, people, especially, you know, in a country where sometimes many evidence, many documents have been destroyed, where there is a huge backlog and where there is a huge demand. But for our first panel, um, we'll discuss the situation within Afghanistan, first um, with Nassim Majidi and Fahim Sadat, and I'll then turn to Naima Shahan for an, anal an analysis um, of the situation of Afghan refugee and host communities in Pakistan. Um, and first, I'll turn to uh, Michael Nassim Majidi. So, Nassim, you're the founder, the director of the think tank and research organization Samuel Lowe. Um, we met almost a year ago in the same place to talk about what the response to this crisis should be. And in the past 12 months, your organization has maintained the research activity in Afghanistan, worked the range of humanitarian development actors. And so first, I'd like to ask you um, to provide us with an overview of the situation in Afghanistan, specifically through the lens of migration and displacement. Thank you, Camille, and, and thank you, MPI, for keeping the focus on Afghanistan across this year. Um, we have been doing our share, as you said, um, with research we've been conducting, notably with IOM, and I want to share with you today just three selected findings that document the changes in displacement um, in, in Afghanistan. So first, 
Displacement is on the rise, but the patterns are changing. So the numbers of those displaced have been higher under the Taliban as Afghans have been caught up in multiple displacements since August, uh, forced to migrate abroad. And now I'll focus mainly on what is happening in Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, we see actually there's a reversal of some uh, of the trends, notably the rural urban migration trend, because urban areas no longer provide the safe haven they used to provide lack of jobs, but also lack of social support they used to get in cities. So the answer has been from the de facto authorities, but also for communities, that the displaced should return to their areas of origin. And return is often also self-imposed, again, due to the economic crisis, the high cost of living, many are returning to rural areas to meet their basic needs. So there's been this multiple um, displacement patterns that we've noted. Now this is leading and the second point is on the social tensions and the social fracturing that we see on the rise and directly linked to displacement. And this is also related to climate change induced displacement, which has actually increased tensions over strained resources. Um, let me give you some examples. People are using natural resources as leverage, um, such as for example, banning water from flowing down streams IDPs in Kabul speaking to us of conflicts related to access to water resources. Um, these, these are some of the very basic uh, tensions at the community level. Now, there are also real fears in urban areas that migrants will steal jobs and the few remaining jobs uh, from, the, from the host community. So there's also more discrimination now against the displaced in urban locations along ethnic and linguistic lines. And there are also obviously related issues to persecutions along ethnic lines. So these tensions you see are, are in urban areas, but also in communities of return. Returnees spoke to us about the negative perceptions um, of displaced populations, both by the host, but also when they return. Um, and, and in general, for example, in Jalalabad and Nangahar, uh, displaced communities are often perceived as transient, as temporary when they want to establish themselves there. Um, so basically communities don't really invest in providing the support emotionally or socially. And this links to my last point, which is on a very strong link between displacement and mental health. And although 10 years ago we did similar research, we found a lot of uh, individual mental health concerns. What we see now is the decline in community health. So WHO um, actually defines this term of community health as the range of environmental, social, and economic resources that sustain the well-being of people within areas. So what we see is that communities don't have those resources. Um, so systematically, respondents are telling us that community members would have helped them before August by providing small loans, food, whatever they had. But that since August, very few people are in a position to provide financial material assistance and aid has been cut down drastically. So this represents also for many Afghan communities a source of shame and anguish. People are just unable to support each other. And within communities now, and that's the last very last point, this is most negatively impacting uh, women and displaced women's health. Um, now, it's not to say that men don't suffer. We also found increases in drug addiction among young men, increases in suicide rates among men in Herat province. But mostly we find that women whose mobility is reduced, wh whose networks are broken, have less support um, from their communities, have increased feelings of depression and anxiety, are split from their fathers, their husbands, and their families. And that in these contexts, Often men's mental health are better understood than women who are defined, labeled, as they tell us, as lazy or as uh, wanting as a wife and mother. So they're stigmatized. So there's really, I would say, the structural displacement patterns, the community decline, and the individual mental health issues we've noted in our research. Thanks, Nassim. And you mentioned, uh, you know, aid. You've worked in Afghanistan for, for many years before, have a long experience advising humanitarian development organization, what do you think should be should be the next move for them at, at this point? Right, so right now, one of the concerns we have is that we would really kind of advocate and recommend for impartial aid delivery. The same people we interviewed told us that aid distribution has not only decreased, but is also unequal in its distribution 
by area, by district, or based on personal relationships, even more so than before. Um, and we also see that there's an overall lack of um, transparency, information, communication by humanitarian and development organizations. They, they should be more open with their data, more open with their actions than less, but in a way similar to what is happening in Iran in terms of a bit of self-censorship by humanitarian and development organizations. We see a bit the same thing in Afghanistan happening today, failure to publish, promote, share data, or openly discuss the real critical issues that should be driving aid. There's not enough accountability right now, not enough learning. So impartial aid delivery on its many different aspects and facets is what we recommend. And also just listening to social and community uh, feedback. If you understand self-protection strategies. Um, again, as I mentioned, social cohesion has been weakened, but people have, communities have come up with their own solutions, such as setting up their own specific councils at the community level, uh, engaging with the Taliban, moving as a key protection strategy. So facilitating those self-protection trends, building on what people do and supporting them, establishing those protection pathways, we should really just be designing programs that respond to what people are already doing on the ground. Um, and lastly, I would say just thinking a bit more ahead. It's not because we're in a context that has drastically changed that some of the ideas we had before shouldn't be implemented now. Thinking about displacement and climate change, thinking about the role of remittances, we shouldn't basically lower our ambitions in terms of defining new ways to help Afghans. And so that's what I would be pushing for. Thank you very much, Nassim, for sharing your, your experience and analysis. And I would also like to emphasize this, this need for evidence, monitoring, learning. Um, we've seen there's been some reporting outside Kabul. We know this is more challenging, um, but also really critical to understand what's, what's happening outside um, of the capital. And, and this monitoring is also particularly important that because many donor embassy uh, don't have a physical presence in Kabul anymore, and they cannot have this, um, this close oversight. Um, but with this, I'll, I'll now turn to Fahim Sadat, who is a political and security analyst and head of the Masters in International Relations at the Cardin University in, in Kabul. Um, Fahim, you've been involved and know of many aid actors uh, trying to operate in Afghanistan today. And I think um, a point that's, that's worth reflecting on is the difficulty for humanitarian and development actors to operate in the country now. Uh, we know some agency have hoped it, you know, to manage operation remotely. I think this can make even more difficult uh, to follow operation. Um, could you comment on, on these challenges? Um, thank you. Uh, I would first say that uh, Afghanistan uh, is facing right now a universal poverty according to the World Bank designated uh, international poverty. And in such a situation, you have uh, the Taliban's whose leaders uh, from once heavily sanctioned terrorists are uh, heavily sanctioned de facto leaders of the country now. And the government is not re recognized. So this itself is, I think, a principal challenge for the aid actors uh, to do their work smoothly. Uh, second uh, is that we, we do have a, a lack of a centralized data system. Uh, where uh, uh, all the aid actors um, could know who has been held so far and who is not, uh, which areas are covered and which areas are not. Uh, there is more of an individualistic um, uh, effort of each and every actor, whether local or international, trying to cover uh, and do what they can do. Uh, third, you have the, 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 the Taliban as, as the government, as the de facto authority, who is trying to assert themselves and somehow uh, uh, try to monopolize over the distribution uh, uh, of the aid, which comes at times uh, in, in conflict with the donor agency's uh, 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 approach uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to the solvement of the humanitarian crisis. Uh, 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 for example, uh, the Taliban are still trying to assert in a way that uh, we usually had uh, 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 the law, the previous law, was that uh, whoever wanted to open a humanitarian relief agency, there were certain uh, re rules and regulations. As, uh, for example, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, Afghani were to be paid for the for the license, and uh, now they they uh, they made that like 40,000. 
uh, the chairperson has to be present while uh, uh, so many of the people who, who owned a humanitarian agency or want to open a humanitarian agency in, in Kabul are somehow out of the country for different reasons. Uh, so uh, if the chairperson is not in Kabul, almost that NGO is, 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 is no more active or cannot function. Uh, and, and, and like this, uh, also, uh, uh, I would say there are so many uh, places in Afghanistan where the local NGOs does not have the uh, necessary or the required uh, facilities to reach out there. Uh, there are mountainous, there are uh, hardly uh, roads, there are hardly um, access points uh, that makes it very, very difficult uh, for the uh, NGOs. We have a very good example of the earthquake that happened in, in uh, Pakia and, uh, and uh, host uh, 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 the major problem that the, that was faced by the humanitarian uh, relief organizations was how to access to those areas. Uh, there were hardly any roads and, and other facilities. So uh, uh, also, uh, I believe the environment uh, uh, of the the, the, the political environment where the Taliban are struggling to get legitimization and recognition, which is not happening, uh, is not making them uh, very friendly with the, with the outside world. And uh, at the same time, uh, 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 the outside world does not uh, uh, see uh, the environment very conducive and friendly looking at the restrictions that are happening on the women and, and, and girls, uh, uh, particularly in terms of education. So uh, all of these are the challenges at the moment uh, faced by the, uh, by the Afghans uh, and by the uh, uh, donor community. Thanks, Fahim. And, and as I asked Nassim, you know, can you provide recommendation for, for Western donors ahead of, of the next winter? What type of assistance do you think they should fund in Afghanistan and how they should engage with, with the Taliban administration? Uh, I, I think after the Ukraine conflict, Afghanistan has been chronically uh, ignored. Uh, I, I still think that a comprehensive uh, international response is still needed. Uh, I would suggest a multi-layer approach where the, uh, 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 the international organizations as the or intergovernmental organizations as the secondary actors on the global uh, uh, stage should take the lead uh, in partnership with the local um, NGOs uh, strongly monitored for transparency and accountability measures by the United Nations and the Taliban because you cannot completely uh, ignore uh, uh, or take out the Taliban as a de facto authority. But I would definitely suggest a monitoring role for them jointly with the United Nations. Uh, 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 and uh, regarding the distribution, I would say that it is hugely important that children uh, households headed by women and people with disabilities should be in their top priorities. And also, I would suggest that uh, uh, the, the distribution of aid has to come in two forms. Uh, we have to uh, uh, fund a, a huge chunk of the basic service deliveries, uh, which is more of a permanent solution. Uh, and also, uh, of course, humanitarian aid, because if we give all the, the aid into the humanitarian uh, part, I think the basic uh, uh, service delivery part is, is something of a permanent solution rather than uh, immediate. So it has to, there has to be a balanced approach uh, in funding for both these issues. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I would suggest uh, the international organizations to take a lead, supported by the states uh, and in partnership with the local NGOs. Thank, thanks for him. And, and I think this remark, yeah, summarized well the, the expectation of actors was, you know, what needs to happen to meet the needs um, of civilian. Um, another point I, I'd like that, that I think is worth mentioning has also been the difficulty to channel funding into Afghanistan, given all the banking restriction. Um, there's been delivery of cash, attempts to go other system, but none of these at the moment are sustainable nor scalable and, you know, actually, access to liquidity remains a challenge for, for many aid organizations. So yes, ju just to conclude on the situation in Afghanistan, there is really this acknowledgement for donor on the need for humanitarian assistance. I think we've seen this commitment, even though don't, you know, funding has, has maybe not been to the level um, that, that was hoped for, uh, but there is also this acknowledgement that it's not gonna be enough uh, and that they need to be more of a structural answer to, 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 the, to the crisis.
Um, but now to, to close this panel, I'd like to turn to Naima Shohan, who is the head of technical excellence um, at the International Rescue Committee in Pakistan, um, to get a sense of the situation for Afghan refugees and communities in host communities um, in that country. So since August 15, more Afghan refugees have sought to cross the border to, to Pakistan to seek refuge, um, to reunite with their family there, uh, but also to access safe pathways, um, as we'll discuss with our colleague Fiona and, and Susan in, in a few minutes. But um, Pakistan, of course, has this long history of um, hosting refugees. But when the Taliban took over last year, Islamabad sent a clear message that they should not be expected to extend this generosity again, suggested they've had enough, um, which was maybe a signal sent to Afghan in Afghanistan, uh, but then also to donors in the West. Um, but so Naima, you know, from your perspective, I wanted to ask you what has changed for Afghan refugees and those communities in, in Pakistan since the last year, if you could provide us uh, an overview that would be much appreciated. And thank you, Camille. So just uh, briefly speaking of what you mentioned that Pakistan is hosting Afghan refugees for the last like over 40 years. And uh, currently we are hosting quite a large number in terms of like the 1.4 million registered Afghan refugees. Then we have quite a big number, approximately 800,000 unregistered. And then another um, almost over 700,000 um, Afghan citizen card holders. Um, who are currently living in Pakistan in refugee villages and urban settlements, uh, rural communities. And according to the recent figures, what UNHCR shares that 250,000 uh, Afghans um, are newly, newly arrived post-August uh, crisis in Afghanistan. And uh, this, is, this is the reported number. But when we hear from the government of Pakistan, they report somewhere around like 350,000 people. So you see there is a difference. And um, while there's a lot of influx, there are only 900 people who are reportedly returned back to Afghanistan in this whole period. So, so there is quite a, a decline in, in, in the return. And when we speak to the people and look at the findings of different assessments, like what is pulling them to Pakistan is basically access to different services, including health, employment, um, Again, psychosocial concerns are the biggest issue, particularly when it comes to the specialized issues for the individuals, and especially for women in particular. Nassim already mentioned about it. So, so it is one of the major concern. And of course, access to basic services. Now, when they come to Pakistan, there are primarily border crossing points from KP province and Balochistan province, and they are the province which are hosting most number of Afghan refugees in Pakistan. And the, basically the way it works here is that mostly uh, Afghanistan are getting services from the public services um, like health facilities, schools and other services offered by government. And with the new arrival, uh, they are supposed to get the services from the same facilities. But when it comes to specialized services, it becomes super challenging for them because they don't have the documentation. They are not registered, for instance. So you know, getting specialized services is already, always an, an issue. So when they, and also when they cross borders and coming from, for example, Chaman and Kila Abdullah districts in Pakistan, they mostly try to migrate to the urban areas at like bigger cities because Chaman and Kila Abdullah has less facilities, I would say, and, and the less opportunities. And so, so during this whole migration towards the rural urban cities, they generally face a lot of like harassment if there are police checkpoints. So there's a fear of arrest and detention and sometimes uh, deportation back to the country. So, so, so these kind of issues exist. And also many of the uh, Afghans who are crossing borders are living with their relatives or their tribal members or any acquainted they have in Pakistan. And one of the major challenge in that front is like, because they're already living in like make and shift shelters, particularly those who are uh, with a low socioeconomic status, uh, they're already struggling with the resources. So in that regard, uh, it, it's always challenging in terms of, you know, having safe shelter. There are a lot of cases of exploitation, particularly when it comes to children and women. Um, there are increased risks of child labor and stuff like that. And um, so, so yeah, these are a few, few things which are uh, most pertinent, I would say. Uh, 
Thanks, for, for Neymar, for that. And, you know, I mean, IRC is the organization we, we work with, um, is one of the many humanitarian organizations that deliver assistance um, to refugees as well as those communities. So um, my question for you is, you know, can you say a few words about what IRC is doing to um, assist this group, but also what challenge you're facing on the ground uh, to deliver this, uh, this aid? And um, okay, so if I speak specifically about IRC and other uh, organizations working in Pakistan, we have evolved our approach, like with this whole changing strategy where you know Afghanis, Afghan refugees have to take services from the public service points. And um, so a lot of our work is mostly at the strengthening the government facilities, like for example, working with the schools, with health facilities, making sure they have enough infrastructure, human resource and supplies to cater the additional load of Afghan refugees and host communities, which is already overstretched, even like for the Pakistani um, population. And then there's a lot of work is being done at the community level and individual level as well. Like, for example, the new arrivals were coming in, they are in dire need of like, for example, NFI assistance and um, psychosocial support, I would say some sort of like, um, you know, legal assistance in terms of uh, how to get registered, how to get support to, to, to address some of the uh, issues related to harassment and exploitation. And Secondly, we what we have also started doing is that having more kind of like interventions where we can reach out to the new arrivals in the population who is unregistered, for instance. So and, and having like multi-sectoral response where you have a combination of health, education, wash protection services. And so, so, so they can, you know, get all these services from one service delivery point, for instance. So we have um, expanded, like for example, in the border, border districts, having mobile health units. So for those who cannot come to the health facilities, they can get services there because of any reason. If they are coming to health facilities, so there is additional human resource and supplies which are not for registered and not compromising for the host community needs, but you know just to cater the additional needs of the refugees. And then at the community level, there's a lot of efforts going on in terms of like peaceful coexistence, social cohesion efforts to bring refugees and hosts together and having more acceptance for the new arrivals, um, and uh, making sure that their rights and needs are not being compromised and being taken care of. And so, so, so these are a few things which are really important. And I, I would say that in terms of uh, scale of the response is still not much because uh, when we look into the RRP, the needs prioritized is primarily for like 3.64 uh, projected population is there. Um, and the, when we see it's 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 like half of the refugees and host half of the host population, but when we see the funding gap, it's huge. So there are interventions happening at the at, at, at small pockets, but to have like more investment in the system at the system level, uh, strengthening the government capacity for the service deliveries, uh, providing more uh, support in infrastructure, human resource, and, and such sort of elements is, is much needed. Uh, but then there's also need to look into the uh, certain concrete efforts in terms of ensuring the protection of unregistered ACC holders and the new arrival refugees. Uh, so yeah, so so that is something uh, which is uh, which needs to look into, particularly by the government of Pakistan and UNHCR being the lead agency uh, responsible for the registration of refugees in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for for all this thought and um, yeah, overview of of the situation for these groups in in Pakistan. Um, I'd like now to open for question. Um, I think it was mentioned you can use a QA and a box or email um, events at migrationpolicy.org. Um, I'll start with two questions uh, for Fahim and Nassim. Um, one is on the role of Taliban in asking uh, and also monitoring the aid delivery. Um, you know, do you have any insight as to what, what their role has been? Um, and then this question also of coordination uh, between the different actor. Fahim mentioned um, that there was some competition, there was no data sharing. Had there been any effort that you think looked promising in terms of working together? Um, and maybe one last question for Nassim on um, the, the, the children, the young people, uh, if in your research uh, you've noticed a specific vulnerability for, for this group, if you have any data on that. Um, Fahim, I don't know if you want to start and then over to Nassim. Um, I would say uh, uh, if the Taliban has a control over the distribution of aid, uh, this would help them uh, in terms of legitimacy domestically. 
uh, and will uh, also help them consolidate themselves and, and earn uh, more power and, and trust of the people. Uh, and also there is a risk of um, the aid being channeled to the people who are pro-Taliban or who, who share uh, uh, their vision of, of, of uh, 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 politics. Um, it might get uh, distributed or channeled to those people. And uh, uh, if, if this uh, assumption uh, is true, then we will not have the most vulnerable and, and most needy uh, to be covered. Uh, that is why the Tal uh, Taliban uh, uh, wants to have a share or somehow as, as the government, according to them, the means to, to, to control the, the distribution, uh, which is, is uh, of course, not in line with the uh, international community's uh, um, approach to the uh, distribution. I'm going to see more over yes. to you. No, thank you. I mean, there is definitely a control of where the aid goes and a lack of transparency from all sides. Um, respondents we spoke to definitely felt there were especially specific group minority groups uh, who were being marginalized along ethnic lines, um, but also Kuchis, for example, specific group who within Afghanistan have always been vulnerable, are even more vulnerable today, more marginalized, more isolated. And this has to do with Taliban control over where the aid goes. Um, there are openings that we see, however, to engage, to open up a space for dialogue. We have set up over the last year a participatory forum process in Jalalabad with municipal authorities bringing to the table the de facto authorities, but also um, displaced community members. We manage even within all of this to try to have spaces for dialogue. And I think that's what we need to push for, more spaces for conversations that involve women, that involve the displaced, getting everyone around the table. And I think what I see in terms of efforts of working together is the opposite of that. What we see is even more silos than before, agencies working separately and not working together. Um, so there's, there's, uh, there's a need to work together. There's a need to stop controlling the narrative. I think there's so much fear by aid organizations to be criticized for what they do, for their position or for data that they release, that they prefer not putting anything out there, which means today, if you want to have a real conversation on Afghanistan, everyone's relying on their own data and perspective. There's no common common agenda or collective or collective voice. And now just to get to, um, to the issue of children, I know that we, we often um, talk about um, all the gendered perspective, but there is a real generational challenge here, even with climate change and our recent research, climate-induced displacement, whether it's disaster blocking roads to schools, whether it's families who have to reduce the nutrition of their children or take children out of school, beyond Taliban restricting access to services like education for girls, climate change, poverty is restricting access. And so what we see is that children are being perma permanently left out of school and huge generational challenge here that we don't talk about. So a common thread as important as gender priorities in Afghanistan today are priorities over children both kind of governance related restrictions, but also very clear displacement, climate change, poverty related impacts on children. Thanks, Nassim. Um, I, I have a, now a question for, I mean, a few questions for Naima um, from the chat. One is um, how do how can Afghan cross into Pakistan? Like what are the different pathways for them? Uh, what are some of the risks um, that they incur as they, as they do so? Um, second question on the refugee card, how can they register um, and who do they register with and what have been some of the challenge attached to that? And, and one last one on the selection of your beneficiary, how, how do you do that? Uh, you mentioned, you know, that many um, Afghans head towards city, um, is that the priority, you know, do you think more should be done in this urban area or should more be done, you know, in the border region, because that's also maybe where people are the most vulnerable just after they, they've crossed into Pakistan. Okay, so um, starting with the cards currently, uh, so in Pakistan, the registered Afghan refugees get proof of registration card uh, through the uh, government of Pakistan registration authority called NADRA. Um, and UNHCR do a lot of facilitation in that regard. 
but unfortunately, since uh, early this year, late last year, there is no new registration is happening. And many of the POR card holder have expired PORs, but they can still use expired card. And because the government of Pakistan has announced that you can use it. Uh, but what UNHCR is doing with the new arrival, they are doing this screening and they are just documenting their details and kind of like registering their information, but they're not getting the cards at the moment. So, so this, is, this is a big debate even here that like those who are unregistered are who are ACC holders, uh, they should be getting cards, but then of course it requires a lot of resources. So currently there is no registration happening in terms of like, you know, giving them cards, uh, unfortunately. But those who are registered, at least when it comes to certain protection issues or legal aid assistance, uh, it, they, there are options available where UNHCR can provide that support or other organizations can provide that support uh, using that information. And in terms of uh, selection of uh, beneficiaries or areas, um, it, it, it's a bit of tricky, I would say. Like one of the things, particularly when it comes to having more concentrated programming, we generally go for the areas where there is you know, more vulnerable population living in where there's a concentration of refugee population. For example, there have been refugee villages in past or there's a big population in uh, certain uh, cities or, or, or uh, urban rural areas. So th that is to, you know, to, to have more impactful programming and to reach out to the most people through uh, more, I would say, efficient programming um, in a way. Um, um, for uh, like recently when the people were migrating. So one of the way we adopted that uh, we had programmings in the border district. So when people are arriving and they were about to travel to areas, so we provide them with some sort of like NFI assistance, some basic supplies and information so they can take benefit of that. But it's really difficult to, you know, track every single individual or family across the country. And most of the time they don't feel comfortable sharing that information, like where they're heading to because just don't want to keep it like confidential and, and protected with, just to prevent further risks. And, and because there is general risk that they, they, might, be, they might be getting tracked or, or they may face some sort of like consequences if they share a lot of information. They even sometimes hide like whether or not they are refugees and are they coming from Afghanistan. And so, yeah, so if we see most of our programming, like even in KP province, we are currently working in 19 districts with UNHCR. And these are primarily the villages where we had like most of the refugee villages, like it's the camp basically what we call here in Pakistan, refugee villages and um, host uh, urban pop, uh, refugee population living in urban settlements with host communities are present. Um, so, so, so this is a way of doing it. But on the other side, we also have like certain information channels. Like for example, if you need any information, for example, if you are living in Karachi and you need some information about the service provider, so you can contact us and we can share that information with you. We may not be there to directly support them, but we can at least share the information about like where and how to get services. And lastly, your question was around uh, the border crossing points, uh, sorry. So, so, so there are some um, um, formal points like the border crossing points in Chaman, Kil Abdullah, some of the NMDs areas uh, where they have to cross the, 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 the border. Um, uh, and for them, they have to show some sort of like documentation if they're coming to Pakistan. But, in, like, but, but if you have like some critical health needs or uh, are you, you have been referred, so, so it's much easier for you to cross that border. And there have been some, um, un, I would say informal border crossing points, uh, which are, uh, you know, um, which are more sort of like where there's more sort of like smuggling or people are coming through illegal ways across the borders. Uh, and, and, and those are the points where most of the uh, undocumented uh, Afghan refugees are, are basically coming into the Pakistan. Um, and, um, and that is why like when we see the difference, like for example, that the data UNHCR has that is primarily the people who cross through the formal border points. 
but when you go to the community and meet with the people particularly the the, the border districts where we are currently responding you'll find a lot of like new people um, and expanded families living together um, um, who are coming from afghanistan but they are not documented they are not uh, uh, kind of like um, they don't have their documents and that's why they try to hide their identity and stuff like that so so yeah Thanks, Naima, and yeah, for outlining also this, um, what explains the difference in the some of the official data and also what, what you're seeing on the ground. Um, I just have two final questions, uh, one for Nassim and, and one for Fahim. Um, one question, Nassim, on access to justice, because I think that's also um, an area where you, you've done work in the past. You know, what is the situation at this moment, um, you know, in terms of the effort, but also for the access to, to justice system? Um, and I think there's been a lot of effort done in the past 20 years for access to justice for women. Um, what is the international response at, at this point? Is that something where anyone can, can engage? So I think this has been one of those long-standing issues. And again, where I was talking about um, not having enough information, this is really one of the key, key gaps. There's a lot of now confusion, frustration, despair uh, about the lack of justice under the Taliban, which have been reported to us, obviously, from harassment to discrimination, persecution by specific groups. So that's one element of it, justice for specific groups who are being persecuted, who are vulnerable, who need international protection. Um, and then there's the, the, common, um, the common everyday barriers to protection um, and to, to legal solutions. Just take an example, basic legal documentation, uh, civic registration, identity documents, what is a given in most countries around the world. Today, most Afghans, the vast majority of Afghans don't have access to legal identity, meaning if they need tomorrow to be able to get to safety legally, they can't. Um, and again, there have been initiatives over the last um, two decades to set up systems that could um, get people to safety, to justice systems, but we're basically seeing all of that being rolled back just to take one very basic example, because of the US sanctions, um, there's actually now a shortage to even print passports. The papers to print passports are no longer available. So you see the impact of sanctions is also very clearly, uh, not just on the humanitarian and economic front, but also on issues of justice and legal identity. Thanks, Nesima. And I think the issue of passport is a point that the second panel will cover because that's also sometimes a requirement to get to um, another country and then have access to some of this, uh, some of the safe passwords. Um, Fahim, just before we close this panel, I have a final question on, on security because we've seen this recent attack with the Islamic State and other potentially um, other groups in, in Afghanistan. What do you think uh, can be done on the side, you know, of the international presence? What does it mean for their operation? Um, what are the type of, of protection that they can offer for civilians and also to continue the, to operate um, in, in the country? Um, I think uh, right now Afghanistan is almost living in a constitutional gap. Uh, we have a government which is not recognized and we have the leaders of the government who are sanctioned. The gap between the international uh, community and the Taliban over various uh, issues is, is very wide. And uh, this has uh, made the Taliban weaken uh, 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 further. And uh, the more the Taliban are weakened politically, um, the more the uh, opposition, particularly uh, Daesh, uh, will rise. The more the situation deteriorates in, in Afghanistan, the more the opportunity for uh, ISK to rise uh, because it will it will make it easier for them uh, in terms of recruitment. Uh, I think that uh, the threat from Al-Qaeda and the threat from the uh, ISK uh, is a phenomenon that has to be uh, dealt uh, in a, in a, in a, again in a comprehensive uh, cooperation uh, way. Uh, the Taliban alone uh, does not have the ability and the capacity to eliminate these two threats. Uh, there is need for a, for a international response, but that only can come uh, once the Taliban are uh, 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 recognized. And, uh, and, and before the Taliban are recognized, there has to be a lot of concessions uh, uh, given by both sides uh, uh, and, and, and a balance, uh, particularly by the Taliban, uh, to strike between 
what the international community demands and what their hardliners uh, are doing at the moment. Thanks, Fame, for outlining you know, the choices ahead in terms of what, what would a recognition look like and, and what that means also for the security situation in, in the country. Um, and with this, I'm going to close this first panel and hand over to my colleague, Suzanne Fratsky, um, to speak about safe pathways. Thank you so much, Camille. So we are shifting our focus for the second half of this discussion to consider the situation of those who have sought to leave Afghanistan over the last year in search of protection elsewhere. And uh, as you know, we all remember, as Kabul fell one year ago, the US, Germany, France, the UK, a number of other countries had hastily put together this evacuation operation that eventually moved more than 120,000 Afghans and foreign nationals out of the country. And you know, at the time, I think reflecting on it, um, there's a recognition that moving that number of people in such a short space of time was a tremendous logistical feat. But the operation also made evident um, several very clear gaps in the humanitarian system in each of our countries, and specifically the fact that there wasn't a good channel to quickly admit a large number of people who were fleeing an emergency situation. And the refugee resettlement system, which is typically what countries use to admit refugees who are arriving outside of the, the asylum stream, um, the resettlement system itself is incredibly slow and backlogged and not really up to that kind of a task. And this is something that we've seen repeated again, of course, with the Ukraine crisis earlier this year. Um, as a result, many countries relied on workarounds or ad hoc measures to admit Afghans who were at risk under the Taliban government. And unfortunately, these ad hoc measures, um, you know, while important in terms of, of providing um, pathways to admission, often expose Afghans to um, service gaps in services or legal status, which we'll talk about further um, in this, this panel discussion. The other challenge that um, has been the case with the rapid evacuations was that they, of course, left tens of thousands of at-risk at Afghans behind. Um, and this is in part because the workarounds that countries relied on often had no clear process for identifying or prioritizing those who are most at risk. And once the US and other governments left Afghanistan, there wasn't a clear safe route for these individuals or families to leave the country, as we've already touched on, of course, in the, the first panel discussion. So for our um, discussion this morning, we'll be looking at both the situation of those who already left Afghanistan, what have been their experiences since the, the evacuation and the circumstances of those who were left behind and uh, their efforts to find a safe pathway out of the country. We have an excellent panel lined up this morning to touch on all of these issues. And I'm looking forward to introducing each of them to you as we go. Um, as a reminder, uh, please type your questions for our panelists into the Q&A box or email them to events at migrationpolicy.org and we'll reserve some time at the end of this panel to address those questions. So I would like to start by turning to Spojmi Nasri, who is uh, an attorney and a uh, member of the Afghan Response Task Force at the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, Spojmi has been working very closely with um, Afghans, uh, both uh, during the evacuation and now after their arrival in the US. And Spojmi, I wanted to ask you what the situation is of Afghans who arrived to the US in the first evacuations now. What um, what parts of the response have worked well and what have been the, the main struggles of Afghans in the US um, on the ground? And I would just note, of course, that the Afghan Adjustment Act was introduced into the Senate yesterday, um, which seeks to address some of these issues around legal status. So, Sposhmi, over to you. And thank you very much, uh, Susan. So, I know when Kabul fell on August 15 to the Taliban, we all witnessed the horrific images of the desperation of Afghans trying to get onto those planes, whichever country might have been able to get them evacuated. In those, in those 15, 16 days, um, Afghans overall, for those lucky enough to have made it and for those who didn't make it, endured horrendous difficulties, including you know, the suicide bombings, the stampedes. Um, as those Afghans uh, took their, those fortunate enough to get on those cargo planes, took their journey to what was called the lily pads, the US military bases in other countries, they endured difficulties there. The conditions were very, very uh, difficult for many, especially in Qatar and the countries where um, the heat was very high and there was no you know, food and sanitation and large numbers of Afghans were brought in. Um, and then they were brought into what was called the, lily, uh, the safe havens, 
here in the East Coast, uh, in the States, in the military. One of the challenges that we saw, these Afghans were brought in a shorter amount of time. Now, the estimates have been given um, as far as early as last week is there was over 89,000 Afghans um, evacuated. And of the 89,000, approximately 76,000 were paroled in for the two years. And the rest of them were either lawful permanent residents or US citizens. And so as these individuals ended up in these eight military bases, um, they continued to endure hardships that uh, military bases were not meant to house them. It was meant to be temporarily housing, which then in turn turned into nine or 10 months of living on these bases. Some of the military bases were uh, equipped with the facilities to, uh, to accommodate the large number of Afghans, whereas some of the military bases um, did not. They were makeshift, they were made in a huge tents. And the challenges and the difficulties that people were enduring there in terms of the living conditions on some bases were, were um, not what would we like to see. Um, the question you asked about how they are doing in terms of the military bases and transitioning. Uh, there was no clear planning on the part of the US. I know that this is a chaotic evacuation. The Biden administration had been told by advocates close to what was going on in Afghanistan to evacuate Afghan uh, allies, particularly the special immigrant visa holders, the translators, those who worked with the government early on. And for some may may not know, there were some small evacuations that were being done early on in July, and then it got ramped up when the deadline was set in that 15 days. There was no clear pathway of screening. I know, for example, some of my clients um, were not able to get through to bring their families where others were able to bring in family members um, and a whole bunch of people. There was no clear screening in the first few days. And in the chaos, there was no pathway to evacuate the people that we actually needed to evacuate. So now I've, I had the opportunity to visit seven of the eight military bases and I provided legal services along with many, many of my other colleagues and other individuals. Uh, the needs were great. The space was provided in the base. The food was provided on the base. The medical needs were taken care of, um, you know, in terms of what they needed to make sure there was no outbreak of COVID or, or any other um, health related issues. But the, the situation is, is that the Trump administration had sort of, he had taken away the funding. There was no funding and not, not allowing any refugees to come in. Uh, and so when we had this catastrophic uh, number of people coming in all at one time, the, the agencies were not equipped to be able to meet those needs. So then people ended up being on these military bases for eight or nine months. And then as the military bases were not meant to be a permanent housing for and by any means for anybody other than the work that needed to be done on the military, um, Afghans were placed all across the United States. And a lot of them continued to be in temporary housing like hotels, Airbnb, because of the shortages of the hopes. So right now there are a lot of challenges in terms of permanent housing, trying to get people to get employment in those areas and trying to be able to adjust and move forward. And the resettlement agencies are rightfully overloaded. Thank you so much, Sposhmi. Um, a lot of, uh, of real difficulties that you touched on with regard to um, access to, to services and housing and, and also you know, um, employment now that people have actually arrived in the US. Um, but of course, you know, as, as I touched on in the beginning, there are also um, many people who are still seeking um, to leave Afghanistan or neighboring countries to find safety in uh, the US or, or in a different country. So I wanted to turn now to, um, to Sunil Varghese, who is the policy director at the International Refugee Assistance Project, and also to Peter Lucier, who is part of the leadership team at Afghan EVAC, um, to tell us about uh, what the, the remaining needs are on the ground for evacuation and safe pathways out of Afghanistan and neighboring countries, and what have been some of the main challenges that um, people have encountered in actually being able to um, find safe routes out of the country. So Nassim, of course, on our uh, first panel had mentioned, for example, the lack of, of passport paper for people to obtain documentation. Um, so I'll go first to Sunil and then um, to Peter. Great, thank you, Susan. Um, and I think this is a great 
question. It's an important question because um, the main, you know, one of the main uh, issues uh, when we talk about evacuation is the lack of robust, really any uh, feasible humanitarian pathways out of Afghanistan to the United States. Generally, there are three uh, potential pathways. There's a special immigrant visa or SIV program for Afghans who worked alongside and supported the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. There's the refugee process, the U.S. refugee admissions program um, for Afghans who are uh, fearing persecution on account of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group. And then there's a temporary um, pathway called humanitarian parole, which allows uh, someone to enter the United States for urgent humanitarian reasons. Um, and, it, you know, there are thousands of people who are eligible for all three of those pathways in Afghanistan and in third countries. And those pathways are just um, simply not functioning. At um, the International Refugee Assistance Project or IRAP, we've been um, bringing litigation against the U.S. government for years um, due to the bottlenecks in the SIV process. The, from the creation of the Special Immigrant Visa Program, it was uh, plagued with um, inefficiencies and bottlenecks that were primarily the government's doing. And while we've seen you know, some incremental improvements by the administration to make the process move um, a bit quicker, we haven't seen kind of the wholesale innovations and flexibility and streamlining that, um, you know, that we think that the government is, uh, is able to do. Um, similarly, the US refugee program, especially for Afghans, is basically at a standstill. A year ago, the U.S. Um, announced, for example, a special refugee program for uh, Afghans who are employed by U.S.-based media or U.S.-based NGOs. Those Afghans do not qualify for a special immigrant visa, but the program basically doesn't function. It's moving at a glacial space, uh, pace, if at all. In July, I believe uh, it was 127 Afghans entered the U.S. as refugees. Um, whereas there are tens of thousands of people who have been referred to the refugee program. I mean, we can spend hours discussing why. I think, as you heard from the um, uh, the IRC representative in Pakistan, just by way of example, there are tens of thousands of people who have been referred to the U.S. refugee admissions program in Pakistan, but, uh, you know, there, there's just no processing happening. Um, and uh, these, this refugee category is really important because this is the category where you have um, women and girls at risk, former judges, democracy activists, people who, um, whose lives are at risk, um, but there is no pathway out. Um, and then there's humanitarian parole. There are tens of thousands of people have applied for humanitarian parole, um, but the U.S. government just isn't processing applications. And I think you know, just to you know, hand it uh, over to Peter quickly to talk really about the specifics of evacuation. You can just take example of the uh, humanitarian parole program for Ukraine or Ukrainians, where the process itself was reimagined. The Department of State was completely cut out. Um, sponsors did um, they created a new system where sponsors uh, basically did a paper adjudication to directly to USCIS. Um, and the individual was able to, um, you know, basically fly to an airport and get uh, um, vetting and security checks done um, by CBP at the port of entry. There's a whole new system, whereas um, the system that Afghans are subject to right now is, you know, the same system that's basically not been functioning even before the events of a year ago. Um, you know, interminable vetting, um, in-person requirements, documentary requirements that are um, not uh, that are just not um, positive solutions, feasible solutions for when um, people are fleeing um, large-scale uh, crises and displacement, such as um, in Afghanistan today. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there, but uh, happy to really answer um, questions and get more into the specifics. Um, yeah, over to you, Peter. Thanks so much, Sunil. And uh, handing it over to Peter now, you've, of course, been um, involved in, in supporting individuals directly also who are, are seeking um, to leave Afghanistan. So uh, you know, looking forward to hearing your comments on what the challenges have been also um, at the individual level. Um, and so for uh, a little background, Afghan Evac is a, a new organization in the space. Um, uh, Afghan Evac is a, an umbrella organization um, that kind of focuses on deconfliction and, and efficiencies with 
about 180 different, um, mostly volunteer, mostly that were organized kind of since August, since the fall of Kabul. Um, lots of um, American veterans and other people who have Afghanistan connections who, um, who came together and formed a lot of disparate groups and started working on evacuation issues and um, Afghan evac kind of emerged to create a space where everybody could um, come together and um, get information from the United States government and um, make all those things happen. Uh, so I sit uh, both on the Afghan evac team and then on one of the um, member organizations of, with Team America Relief. Um, just to give you kind of a some size of the scope and the scale and, and what we do. Um, so Human Merit Relief has uh, about 16,500 Afghan families in our database, um, about it's a little over 70,000 individuals at this point. So we see a lot of cases and uh, Neil did a really good job of kind of covering the types of people and some of the legal challenges. Yeah, I think I can get into a little bit like, um, if something can go wrong in EVAC, if something can prevent a successful EVAC from happening, um, it, it will happen. And here's what kind of some of those look like. So what, what does it actually on the ground like mean? What are we really talking about? Um, that's what I do with Team America and Afghan EVAC. Uh, there's two kind of primary pathways that we're talking about. The first is, and these are all um, pathways that are going to end with permanent resettlement in the United States. So for the European audience, um, it, that's just outside of the scope of my work and what I know. Um, so these are all ending uh, with permanent settlement, uh, resettlement and status in the United States. First pipeline is um, the U.S. government, the CARE, the State Department um, CARE pipeline. Uh, which involves U.S. government-funded flights in partnership with some other countries, um, flight from Afghanistan to a third country uh, where um, usually immigrant visa processing is finished or the new, um, when it works, the rapid refugee processing happens uh, and then folks eventually um, come to the United States. The other option would be a kind of, a, we call it the self-funded option, um, where an applicant will self-relocate to a third country the, the vast majority are Pakistan, but um, other folks have found themselves in third countries, uh, Albania, UAE, um, as well as, you know, various countries in Europe. Um, so they've gotten themselves there, and they're also attempting to complete immigrant visa processing or uh, refugee processing in that third country where they have access to a um, U.S. embassy or consulate. And these two things often overlap. Uh, so folks who are in Pakistan are often... Um, working kind of both of these pipelines and they can maintain eligibility in both. So it's, it's a big complex system. You know, covers the population of who's actually using these. So usually I'm talking about uh, SIVs, immigrant visa applicants, usually um, family reunification applicants. So LPRs and U.S. citizens who have family members look behind um, in Afghanistan um, and people who are eligible for the um, uh, U.S. RAP uh, programming. What the CARE pipeline looks like and where we start to see a lot of the challenges um, there's just a vast amount of requirements. I'm going to try and screen share. We're going to see if this is going to go well. Um, anybody's ever seen this document? Uh, Susan, can you give me a thumbs up if that screen share is working? Thanks. Okay. So um, just to uh, be eligible for the U.S. government funded um, pipeline, you see this kind of awful seat. Actually, I created this. Um, you know, so there's a vast variety of requirements. Some of those overlap with traditional kind of immigration issues and some of them are uh, specific to um, this particular situation. So um, the folks who are eligible for this, if you're going through immigrant visa processing, basically you have to get to the documentarily qualified stage or the um, what we call the interview ready stage. Um, that provides a lot of difficulties, especially for the I-130 applicants. Um, if the LPR US citizen is actually physically present in Afghanistan, oftentimes they lack the ability to complete the affidavit of support. And that is a really, really common issue that prevents people from hitting that uh, DQ benchmark, which gets people forward, um, and they're not able to show income. So just little things that are common in cases. The eligibility requirements themselves, um, not every immigrant visa category is going to be um, eligible for this flight. The legal authorization for the flight comes from the White House, and so it's actually restricted. It's not it overlaps often with INA, but isn't always. So diversity visa um, uh, like diversity lottery uh, immigrant visa recipients aren't eligible for this. Um, humanitarian parole, even if approved in a third country, would not be able to take advantage of these particular flights. They're only available to certain people who you see on this. So it's a it's a narrower pool. Um, the data requirements uh, necessary in order to successfully affect somebody getting on one of those flights exceed that which is contained in an immigrant visa application. At Team America, we collect 66 data points per individual um, plus normally, you know, 10 to 15 like documents, all of which have to get submitted to the care team in order for one person to get on um, a flight. Uh, then there's the kind of specific physical requirements themselves. 
Um, you need uh, six months of um, validity on your passport, and yeah, passports are hard to come by right now. Um, women who are more than 28 weeks pregnant can't get on these planes due to uh, long processing times in the third country. Um, you have to be willing to um, separate from family members, and if you've previously indicated that you're not willing to separate from non-eligible family members, you can get redlined and um, kicked off of kind of like the manifest list. That's difficult to get fixed. Um, you have to have updated contact information. So people who have switched cell phone numbers, they um, can't get contacted by the contractors on the ground who are making these things happen. Um, all of these little things like can and do go wrong and getting people onto planes is incredibly difficult um, because it's not just traditional like immigration work, although that itself has all of its problems like with uh, SIVs and, and long wait times and family preference categories. Um, every single one of these kind of has to get reviewed and checked by mostly volunteers who are still kind of doing this work, compiling this data, putting it together. Um, it's a huge challenge. We're grateful that the flights are happening, but, um, you know, getting people to that DQ line and then actually getting them on the flight is hugely troublesome. Um, other problems writ large with the care pipeline, flights have shut down before. We're relying on cooperation with the Taliban. So from December 6th until late January, there was like six weeks of, of no flights. Um, it was confusing for folks or people who had actually been on a plane who had to then go home. They had to be housed and getting them onto a new one is really, really difficult. So at any given time, like the relationship with the Taliban has to be kind of strong and negotiated and diplomatic um, because they can at any time kind of stop these flights and it's happened uh, and it's difficult. There's also constraints at every stage in the system. We often talk about throughput. Um, uh, housing crisis in the U.S. affects the ability to actually successfully resettle people. And if we can't resettle them fast enough, we can't fill up the bed spaces in the third country fast enough. Um, and then the flights slow down. We're in one of those periods right now where flight capacity actually could be greater, but it's reduced because of um, slowdowns in the third country stage and then the ability of our resettlement agencies to deal with the, the flux of everybody. So again, any kink in the pipeline can slow everybody down and that equates to really long issues. The immigration issues with SIVs are kind of well known um, right now. Some of the things we're seeing, people who applied for SIVs right now, uh, NBC is still reading emails from uh, late September just to get an initial response from NBC. Um, in order to send in your civil documents or to actually uh, get a response on an inquiry letter, they're still back in March. So, you know, a year before your application has eyes on it by um, NBC, much less uh, the chief of mission, and then, you know, six months to get a response on an inquiry or to update documents um, that you're trying to send in. So SIV issues are, are ongoing. I talked a little bit about the um, affidavit of support requirement issues that we're seeing. Um, those happen in third countries as well, and we're seeing people like frustrated cases send six months to a, you know, a year in third countries and it's, it's getting difficult. Like the data issues are messy. The passport requirements are ongoing, um, especially for folks in third countries. Some of the self-funded challenges that we're facing, there's a large population in Pakistan. Um, they're running out of money. Even SIVs who've been able to get, um, you know, interviews at the embassy in Islamabad um, are spending long periods of time because that SIV post-interview um, security vetting is still far too long. Um, so folks who are, you know, already have left everything that they've owned and, and often don't have a lot of money in the bank are having to self-fund their, you know, stay in Pakistan away from support networks, family and friends. And they're running out of money. They have to continuously renew their um, visas in Pakistan. Just getting to Pakistan and getting a, a PAC visa um, is a difficult requirement for a lot of folks. Um, again, like just anything that kind of can go wrong will and, you know, multiply that time, the 70,000 folks that we're working with, plus, you know, um, probably a total of 100, 120,000 that the entire Afghan EVAC coalition is working with. Um, there's just manpower issues of trying to clean up every single one of these individual cases to make it perfect um, to get on one of these planes. So everything has to be perfect. One thing can keep you off. Um, any other populations that we occasionally see in the coalition, uh, student visas, we're seeing lots of challenges there. It's just, um, you know, a presumption of immigrant intent, but we're still seeing a lot of denials for Afghans despite new um, guidance in the FAM. Uh, that's been incredibly frustrating for folks who are trying to get into school in August. I've talked for way too long, but that's, if that gives you kind of a scope of the idea of the issues that we're dealing with, it's still a very kind of broken process at every single phase. Um, it's moving along, uh, but it, it's kind of flooding out there. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, and I wanted to turn now to 
Fiona Kendall, who is with the Federation of Protestant Churches in Italy. And um, FCEI has been operating a uh, fairly um, unique and, and novel program um, for Afghans that built on some of their other work uh, with humanitarian corridors more broadly. And I uh, want to welcome Fiona to tell us a little bit about what you've been doing to try to build a more sort of um, uh, you know proactive and, and streamlined system to enable those who need protection to um, find it in Italy. So Fiona. Thanks, Susan, and uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in this hugely interesting seminar. Um, yes, the Federation of Protestant Churches in Italy, along with some other faith organisations, has been operating humanitarian corridors to Italy since 2016, beginning first with a pilot uh, from Lebanon into Italy and then expanding to other countries such as Jordan, Niger, Ethiopia and so on. And I think the, the reason I mention that is that we the initiative, the model, was already embedded within the Italian system when the Afghan crisis uh, erupted. And that therefore gave us an opportunity, um, and indeed the government, an opportunity quickly to consider the possibility of opening a humanitarian corridor for Afghans. The difference between humanitarian corridors and, and a simple evacuation programme is that it's not just about safe passage or about airlift but it's also about an integration process. It's about proper preparation of those who are being transferred. And it's then about support for a period of at least a year, if not two, if not longer, um, to enable people to become um, members of the society uh, to, to which they are, they are moved. So the challenge for us was how could we make that work in a crisis context? Um, it, I guess the difference was that there was great goodwill on the part of everybody. We didn't have to petition the government to have this opportunity. Um, but I guess what none of us anticipated was that the Ukrainian crisis would intervene. And so all the carefully laid plans were interrupted. The protocol that the government was signed in November 2021, but it wasn't actually until last month that finally people were able to arrive in Italy through this corridor. It's important to stress, I think, that the corridor does not enable people to come directly from Afghanistan to Italy, regrettably. And I guess for obvious reasons, the decision was made at this stage in any event simply to operate in countries that neighbour Afghanistan. And so at this stage, the corridor is open only for people who are already in Pakistan or in Iran. And that is troubling um, in the sense that those who are involved in the programme are desperately concerned about the relatives that they've left behind in Afghanistan. And unfortunately, we just don't have a way to offer them participation in the programme at this stage. So the protocol allows us to bring 1,200 people over a period of two years from these neighbouring countries uh, to Italy. Um, and so far, around uh, 400, uh, sorry, uh, around one quarter of those provided for have, have come to Italy. Differently from other humanitarian corridors, the government itself will take responsibility for 400 of the people who come, in other words, a third of the people who come. This is a new development because up until now, the humanitarian corridors have primarily been the responsibility of civil society. And that, on the one hand, has given us a great deal of freedom as to, to how we operate the corridors. But it's not a sustainable model because at the end of the day, um, faith-based organisations, however much goodwill uh, is around, also need funding. And so having the government participate in this particular project uh, by proactively hosting people was a significant step uh, for us in terms of the development of the model. The government also agreed that it would fund the costs of transporting people in this situation, something which has not happened with other humanitarian corridors. In the end, unfortunately, the government wasn't able to come good with that, and we were fortunate to have the uh, involvement of another NGO called Open Arms, uh, helping with flights uh, out of Pakistan and Iran uh, to Italy to enable what could have uh, not happened to happen. It's been challenging. I mean, there have been some real positives uh, because the corridor is primarily a civil society model. It's enabled us to work with organisations that haven't historically been involved up until now. There have been some uh, non-faith-based organisations involved in this process. 
and also to enter into collaborations with groups of people who would never have become involved before. So, for example, one group that um, my own organisation is involved in, in um, hosting or, or looking after is a group of 60 female athletes from Afghanistan. And specifically, we have a collaboration with one region in Italy, with journalists, with sports organisations, with a private funder, bodies that wouldn't normally necessarily have the opportunity to, to become directly involved in a programme like this. And that has to be, from our perspective, really valuable in terms of expanding the possibilities for moving people from places of, of challenge to places of safety. There were, of course, some real challenges because this was untested in the places that we were operating. Untested for us, untested also for the consular authorities there. We didn't have a ready network on the ground in Pakistan and Iran. We didn't have a team on the ground. And I think a lesson that we've learned from this is that we would, if we can't have a team on the ground, ensure in future that we at least have short term missions to establish those contact, contacts. Dealing with everything remotely is difficult. It's challenging. I think um, there were contextual issues that we didn't expect. The fact that you can't make direct payments uh, into Iran, for example, little things that nonetheless cause real difficulties in terms of, of the practical application of a programme. The consular staff weren't used to dealing with a corridor of this nature, nor the time pressures. Health checks were carried out, we felt, ultimately at the last minute. So people had to be prevented from boarding because only at the last minute were traces of TB, for example, found in people's systems. We didn't have time to check whether that was historic or whether it was live. These are tweaks. These are things that we will learn for the next, for the next scheduled corridors. But it's unfortunate that these were things that we didn't anticipate right at the start. I think what also was a challenge for us was how the speed and um, the nature of the process undermined, from our perspective, the quality of the programme. Because as I explained at the beginning, humanitarian corridors are not just about airlift, but also about post-arrival support and pre-departure orientation and indeed message messaging. And if we're not able to effectively carry out good structured pre-departure orientation, if we're not able to manage people's expectations, they're not so well prepared for what awaits them on arrival. And so, for example, within the group, some of the groups that arrived, we understood that some people had the impression that Italy could be used as a springboard for onward travel onto other places. And that absolutely is not the point of the programme. The point of the programme is to enable to come to Italy and to set up new lives here. These are learning points. Um, I think the really positive piece uh, of news in all of this is that there was such extraordinary goodwill around, not just from civil society and from government in Italy, but also in the countries of departure. We were really blessed by the efforts and the commitment of the people on the ground there and really grateful to them for that. So we're hopeful that we can make the remainder of the protocol work smoothly um, using some of the knowledge that we've gained so far. Thank you so much, Fiona. A fascinating process to hear about. Uh, we have quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, so given uh, our time constraints, um, what I am going to do is try to combine them into a few different um, groups of questions and then uh, pose them to, to each of you in turn. Um, I think we'll probably have time for one round of, of responses and then maybe some closing comments. Uh, the first um, set of questions that has come in is around the situation of those who are still in Afghanistan. And you know, a number of, of our panelists here touched on the fact that it's quite difficult to get out of Afghanistan for, um, for a number of different reasons. And we have a, a few people asking specifically about what, um, what routes out of Afghanistan do currently exist and um, in, in what ways it's actually feasible to leave Afghanistan and travel to uh, a neighboring country and then um, onwards to the US or, or Italy or elsewhere. Um, the second uh, set of questions is around the status of parole applications. Um, and what the you know Sunil and also Peter mentioned, of course, the the major backlogs and the lack of processing there. Um, whether or not there is any processing happening, and um, what uh, some of the those individuals who are currently in the queue for parole application processing can expect going forward. Um, we also had a question about the situation of those who have been transferred to Kosovo for additional security processing, um, who were in the the parole and resettlement pipeline. 
to the U.S. and some of them have now been denied um, resettlement. Um, there's a question about what options those individuals have and sort of what what can be expected there going forward. Um, and finally, uh, we've had a few questions around uh, the situation of, of those who have already been admitted, um, particularly uh, the the ability to apply for um, legal status through the asylum system. Uh, we know that uh, you know asylum claims are are being processed at the moment. Um, and we have a, a few um, participants asking about what the status of that is, um, how the processing is going, how long we can expect that process to take, uh, and then also what kind of um, support uh, these individual, individuals are, are currently receiving, particularly around employment. Um, so I might uh, pass it first to, um, to Sunil, if you might be able to speak to um, the, the points around routes out of Afghanistan and parole applications and perhaps those in um, who have been transferred to Kosovo for additional security screening. And any other, any other points that you wish to take up, but I think we'd particularly welcome hearing from you on those issues. Sure. Um, uh, there's a kind of a, several questions there and I'm not sure, um, but I'll kind of touch on the general process. So um, for people who um, Peter described, um, that are for the small, very, very small number of people who can, um, of Afghans who are able to uh, get on an evacuation flight out of Afghanistan. Generally, they uh, fly to Camp Asalia in uh, Qatar. Um, there, um, oftentimes, they uh, undergo either special immigrant visa processing or there's a small pilot for expedited refugee processing. Um, in Camp Basilio or CAS, CAS. Um, generally, well, it used to be that people, um, the government of Qatar would allow Afghans who were being flown into CAS to stay there for 30 days, 45 days. Um, and generally those whose refugee processing were uh, was to take longer, they'd um, be transferred to Camp Bansil in Kosovo to await uh, continuation of refugee processing there. Um, and the process isn't this clean. There's a lot of exceptions. I'm just generally kind of painting the picture here. Couple caveats there. This The people, as you saw from um, Peter's list, uh, generally people who are referred to the US refugee program by UNHCR, by an embassy, by an NGO, or have access to the refugee program through um, because they work for a US-based NGO or a US-based media organization, they do not qualify for evacuation flight. So that expedited refugee process is really for people kind of outside those that have been referred to the US refugee program already. So, uh, you know, just kind of the general, general remark there is that there is nothing happening for people who've been referred by UNHCR embassies or like qualify for the uh, refugee program for US-based, uh, for Afghans who are employed by US-based media or NGOs. They're, they do not qualify for evacuation flights. Generally, they don't end up in Kosovo because to get to Kosovo, you would have to like be transferred there for further processing. Another remark I would kind of put out there, but again, these are, these are complex issues. So follow up with me or with someone if you want to follow up, but, um, uh, refugee processing, one of the reasons, many reasons that it's very slow uh, is um, over the years, the just not just the Trump administration, but the United States has kind of layered um, layers on layers of security checks and vetting that oftentimes the intent is to basically keep refugees, often refugees from Muslim majority countries out of the US. Um, and so some of the checks uh, that are being run, they're just you know, you, uh, for example, take social media checks, the amount of matches um, is so substantial that it takes forever to pour through a lot of data to see is there an actual actionable derogatory information that would make someone inadmissible to the US. Most time there isn't, but it just takes a lot of time because the US system is set up to uh, have all these layers to keep people, especially refugees from Muslim majority countries outside the US. So that process, this administration has not taken steps to kind of streamline or eliminate some of those processes. And so people are in Camp Bonsio kind of awaiting uh, 
uh, vetting for a long time, and I don't know, uh, you know, the, at least they're in the process because a question about folks who are in Albania, for example, people who are in UAE, UAE is a little bit of a different example, but um, during the evacuation a year ago, um, countries around the world, you know, accepted uh, evacuation flights for people with the idea that the U.S. There would there would be some plan, but Albania is a good example. There's no plan. There's no like refugee processing. There's no evacuation flights. Um, a lot of the funding has kind of moved to NGOs that are working on Ukrainian programs. A lot of the European pathways are focused around Ukrainians. People are stranded in third countries. There's literally no plan, and there's no hope of a plan really because there's no process. Um, and the last general observation um, would be on humanitarian parole, the US system for Afghans and really everyone other than Ukrainians in the U for U uh, Ukrainian Uniting for Ukraine program requires the US requires an in person component um, to uh, to verify identity and to um, do security checks before they're able to tra travel, um, before Afghans are able to travel. That's the US process. And the US is um, saying that because they do not have a consular presence in Afghanistan, they cannot process um, uh, humanitarian parole applications for people in Afghanistan. Um, again, this is the process the United States has imposed on itself, that there are uh, innovative and flexible ways, I think, to get around it that, again, you've seen in the, um, in the Ukrainian parole program, where there are other ways to either uh, in other ways to confirm identity and complete security checks um, and other ways that we are able to just to carry out government functions in Afghanistan without having like a whole uh, coterie of um, consular officials there. Even conditional approval could ease someone's uh, journey outside the country because at least it's a document. So it is true that for the vast majority of humanitarian parole applications, they're not being acted on under that, uh, using that kind of excuse. Um, and I believe the vast majority of those that have been adjudicated have been denied. Um, and, uh, you know, just humanitarian parole is a discretionary program, but there does, uh, at least at the outset, seem to be kind of a higher level of evidence required, um, just kind of, uh, just, you know, unnecessary processes that I think really um, continue to keep Afghans who want to, um, who, who, fear that their lives are at risk, um, that they're kind of uh, jammed up and stuck in Afghanistan without a way to get out. Okay. Thanks so much, Sunil. And we had an additional question come in um, for Fiona specifically around how the beneficiaries of the humanitarian corridor are identified and how you're actually um, able to, to bring people into the program. Um, I want to turn first, though, to Spojmi um, and ask uh, specifically about the, uh, the two questions we had around the status of asylum applications, individuals who are seeking long-term status um, in the U.S. after having arrived on parole, how that is going, and also what kind of support um, is being directed to individuals, particularly around employment. Um, so, um, as, as you, you're aware, or may not know, the, the Afghans who were brought in, they were what's called paroled in for two years. Um, and then within that two years, um, the U.S. immigration law is that you have to apply for asylum within one year of admission. Um, and then there's extraordinary circumstances, which if you can show that, then you can file for asylum beyond the one year. Um, thus far, as I was saying earlier, we've had 76,000 Afghans hurled in approximately. Of those to date, um, the numbers that were given is maybe roughly between two to 3,000 individuals have filed for asylum, which that in and of itself shows you the, the challenges in that. One of the biggest challenges in applying either for asylum or continuing with their special immigrant visas whether they had started in Afghanistan, partly completed it, or starting all over here, is finding legal representation. So, um, you know, attorneys across the country, nonprofit organizations, law schools, and private uh, attorneys um, have stepped up to be able to provide legal services for, for Afghans. Even despite that, the challenges have been quite large because people are not able to retain pro bono attorneys. In the United States, you don't have a right to an immigration attorney. So a lot of the nonprofit organizations um, have been assigned these individuals for casework and they're trying to assist them with their immigration cases. So there's been challenge there, which is why 
Um, so many people have been advocating for the Afghan Adjustment Act, which would give um, a straight pathway for all those Afghans paroled in. So a lot of work has been done in terms of education and advocacy, um, but legal representation is still a dire need within the community, particularly uh, everyone was uh, concerned about meeting the one year deadline. So there's been a lot of education around that. In terms of employment, for those Afghans that have been settled, uh, they were given a two year work permit. The challenges in the work uh, um, arena is the language barrier. Um, we, a lot of people tend to think all these Afghans that were brought in because they work with the US government or uh, in some entity they were translated as they speak English. Um, from my own experience at the military bases, there's quite a few number of individuals who don't speak. So there have been a lot of organizations, nonprofits, private sectors coming in together to provide employment for these individuals. But the challenges continue to be the language barrier, adjusting permanent housing. As I said earlier, some of them are in temporary housing. So finding permanent employment has been a little bit difficult. One of the jobs that individuals are looking for, for example, is uh, Uber or Lyft to be able to drive. But in certain states like California, you have to have a driver license for a certain amount of time before you are able to be um, able to work for those companies. Uh, but overall, I've seen a lot of organizations like Welcome US and other um, private organizations or churches um, coming together to find employment. So the challenges are there, but I'm seeing that some people are finding employment. And just one last thing, the last number of people, the younger people want to go back to school. So there are a lot of educational institutions that are actually setting up scholarship for Afghan refugees. Every day I see them pop up, whether it's a local community, college, or a university, there are a lot of opportunities for students to be able to go to school and continue their education. Thank you, Shpojme. And I just wanted to mention, um, Sunil had also pointed out in the in the chat, of course, that there was the Afghan Adjustment Act, which was introduced into the Senate yesterday, which would seek to address some of these long term status issues and provide a, a pathway to residency for Afghans who are paroled in. Um, I'm going to turn to um, Peter, if you would like to respond very, uh, very quickly to the questions, particularly around you know pathways out of Afghanistan and the status of parole applications. Um, and then to Fiona for last word around the um, the selection of beneficiaries for the humanitarian corridor program and i apologize we'll go just a few minutes over but try to um, wrap up in the the next five minutes or so so peter i'll be very brief just i mean i really just doubling down on everything uh Sunil mentioned really too um uh, I'll, I'll talk slower i gotta have to talk slower um so the first point i just would want to follow up on what i said previously is what Sunil said is exactly correct that the pipeline I'm talking about is, in, is incredibly limited. Um, and specifically, it um, favors uh, the SIV applicants, particularly um, with you know um, family immigration being shortly behind. But um, these eligibility criteria really clearly benefit either people who worked with the United States military during our 20 year period there, um, or people with connections to the United States, uh, those who face uh, you know, persecution for race, religion, um, and the other nexuses uh, are, are are not included, which makes this um, a really frustrating pipeline to work within because there's lots of people who, um, you know, based on their need and their fear and their risk, I think somebody said earlier that, you know, this isn't a system that necessarily includes risk in its decision-making matrix for um, persecution. It uh, considers connections to the United States and, um, how far you've progressed along your uh, uh, immigrant visa processing, and uh, you know how how long you can last uh, in Pakistan um, with the money that you have and, and how good of support you have, which makes this um, really unfortunate. We talk a lot in Afghani back that we um, we don't want this to be an evacuation of the well connected, right? Um, and so I think just broadly as a policy issue, you need to be really careful as a country to. Um, you know, can consider all of the people we're currently leaving behind. It's not just our wartime allies, right? There's a lot of folks who um, legitimately fear what their life will be like under a Taliban government, and they're not currently included um, in these eligibility pathways. Um, and just if um, you're interested in more information like this, if there were some terms that I had never heard before, if you're involved with an organization, um, 
uh, you can feel free to go to afghanevac.org um, and you can uh, sign up. We have meetings every two weeks. Um, there's a lot of good information there. So um, if you aren't familiar with the care pipeline and you want to know more, um, uh, you can find, you know, uh, reach out to me or um, sign up and, and join the coalition. Um, good work being done. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And Fiona, over to you for the last word. Thanks, Susan. So, um, yes, just to summarize, the beneficiaries, a terrible word, but the beneficiaries of this project are Afghan citizens who are clearly in need of international protection and their family members. And they can be identified in one of two ways, either because they have at least prima facie recognition of refugee status from UNHCR or have refugee status, or they present the um, prerequisites for such identification. It's important to say though, that it doesn't have to be UNHCR that carry out the identification process. One of the um, key features of humanitarian corridors is that the civil society organizations involved in hosting are also involved or have the opportunity to, to be involved in the identification process. And so one of the key factors that is always taken into account is the um, level of vulnerability, because of course there are far more people who would present as uh, proper candidates for the programme than there are places. And so vulnerability is an issue that is often considered. In the case of the Afghan programme specifically, um, factors such as the kind of work that these people carried out in Afghanistan, if that caused particular difficulty for them because they worked, uh, for example, uh, in, as translators or you know, in situations such as that, or people whose family members were airlifted in the Airbridge back um, in August of last year. So there are some specific factors uh, for this particular protocol that we wouldn't normally expect in general humanitarian corridors programmes, but which pay attention to the particular needs of this situation. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're joining uh, the discussion from. And I also want to um, specifically thank our colleague, Lisa Dixon, who um, is our events uh, coordinator here at MPI and is all of the, um, manages all of the behind the scenes technical details to ensure that our conversation could happen this morning. Um, I also want to apologize for the many, many questions that we did not have a chance to answer during our conversation. We appreciate all of the, the questions everyone sent in and unfortunately did not have time to, to get to all of them. Um, if you uh, want to review the, the audio or video recording, um, those will be available on the MPI website after the event. Uh, for any members of the media who are on the call, please feel free to contact Michelle Middlestat at M. Uh, M Middlestat at migrationpolicy.org with any questions. That's M M I T T E L S T A D T at migrationpolicy.org. Um, thank you so much again to everyone for joining uh, and wishing you an excellent rest of your day.